Welcome to Legally Speaking, a podcast from the Utah Attorney General's Office. Here, we will be discussing matters of policy and justice, cases that our office is taking on, hot topics in Utah and in the world, but of course, it will all be done <coughs> legally speaking. Hello, I'm Richard Pye from the Utah Attorney General's Office. Welcome to Legally Speaking. I'm here with Assistant Solicitor General Lance Sorensen. We're talking about tribal rights, treaty rights of the Utah and Idaho Indian tribes. And the case that we're talking about right now is the Northwest Band of the Shoshone Indian Tribe versus the state of Idaho. An unusual case where we are actually opposing Idaho in the case and are with on the side of the federal government. Lance, thanks for joining us. That was a long explanation. Kind of boil it down for us really fast and tell us what this case is all about. Sure. This case is about uh, the treaty fishing rights and hunting rights of one of uh, Utah's eight federally recognized tribes, the Northwestern Band of Shoshone. Uh, and the Northwestern Band, their ancestral fishing and hunting grounds includes parts of Utah, parts of Idaho, Colorado, Wyoming, Nevada. And so uh, we have a relationship with them where we recognize their right under a treaty from 1868 to hunt and fish, but Idaho doesn't. Okay. And so we've inserted ourselves into the case to give the court some perspective on how Utah recognizes that right and how okay. we interpret that treaty. All right, so back in 1868, we yeah. entered into an agreement with, the, with Shoshone and Idaho and Colorado and the other parties involved were all on the same page and well, basically said, you, got, you can hunt on these lands. Is that what the original intent I'll of the treaty in 1868? clarify that. So the treaty is signed before the existence of Idaho and Colorado and Utah. So it's a treaty between the United States and okay. the Shoshone. So if I back up just a little bit okay. for some historical context, because in Indian law, history really does matter. And sure. in order to do Indian law, you have to have some of that historical okay. background. So the Shoshone people are affiliated bands. There's several of them that would hunt and gather in much of the Western United States. Um, and as white settlers moved into the western United States, that led to tension and competition for resources and acts of violence. In 1863, at the encouragement of some Mormon settlers in Cache County, what became Cache County, Cache Valley, uh, the United States Army came in and massacred a large number of the northwestern band of Shoshone on the Bear River, mm -hmm. which is their encampment was just north of present day Preston. Um, between 300 to 500 Indians were killed on one morning mm -hmm. in 1863. And that was, that's a pretty famous case. Yeah, well, up until recently, the massacre didn't have much attention, and the northwestern band and the former chairman, Darren Perry, has done a good job in getting that story out so people understand what happened. Um, so that's 1863, nearly decimated tribe trying to survive. And the United States after that comes in and it begins enacting treaties with Indian groups all across the West, primarily because the United States wanted to build railroads and settle the West okay. and wanted to settle the violence that was going on with Indians. So the Treaty of 1868 is between the Shoshone groups, um, six or seven bands on the one side and the United States on the other side. Congress had commissioned these um, Indian agents or commissioners to come out and negotiate these treaties. Uh, and when I say negotiate, this is important for the case. Um, this isn't two equal parties, right? Two parties with equal bargaining power coming to the table and you know saying, well, let's figure this out. It's really the United States coming in with the guns pointed at the Indians and saying, here's your offer, and if you don't accept it, we're going to look at exterminating you completely. So that's the unequal bargaining power of the Treaty of 1868. Okay. So what does it do? Um, the Indians promise to give up their t claims to land title and this is 44 million acres of land, Utah, Idaho, Colorado, Wyoming, parts of all of these states, right? Um, and they also agree to keep the peace. Uh, so what does the United States promise in return? The United States promises the creation of a couple of reservations 
Um, and the idea behind the reservation system was to have the Indian tribes relocate onto the reservations and uh, that would be territory that the United States would protect from further settlement encroachment. So the promise is to create those reservations and the United States would also create some annuities and some government buildings, some schools, and some government agents. And so part of the treaty says Indians will agree to go to these reservations, uh, but they reserve the right to continue to hunt and fish off reservation. This is very important to them because this is how they're surviving in 1868. And they wanted to make sure that's in the treaty of 1868, right. to be able to hunt and fish. Um, so the United States does create two reservations, one in the Wind River, uh, for some eastern Shoshone and one in Idaho called the Fort Hall Reservation which mm -hmm. is for a Shoshone group and a Bannock group and those tribes do relocate to the reservations. The Northwestern Band, again nearly decimated in 1863, uh, does not go to the reservation but continues to live northern Utah, southern Idaho, first as kind of tenants of the LDS Church and then they're able to purchase some land of their own and create some businesses and survive. Uh, but they don't go to the reservation. So between, the 18, between 1868 and the present day, United States Indian policy goes through a couple of different important phases. In the 1880s and 90s, United States tries to assimilate all Indians into what was then considered American culture. This was the era of boarding schools, trying to take the Indian out of the Indian, essentially. Mm -hmm. And that's followed by a period of termination, which is to terminate tribal sovereignty altogether, to terminate tribal governments. Uh, and that goes up through the 1940s and 1950s. Then finally, in the 1960s, the United States reverses course and adopts a policy of government to government relationships. So this is kind of a U-turn and saying, look, these tribes have sovereignty, they have governments, and we should recognize them as such. So since the Nixon administration all the way to the present, every presidential administration and every Congress has recognized that tribal sovereignty and has a government to government relationship. And in the 1970s, um, the Bureau of Indian Affairs created a process by which each tribe could be formally recognized as a government to establish formal relationships. And so that's a, a process of recognition. The Northwestern Band was formally recognized in the 1980s as a, a tribal government with a uh, government structure. And so since that time, um, Utah has worked with the Northwestern Band on their fishing and hunting rights in Utah, um, pursuant to this treaty going all the way back to 1868. Idaho has not. And so there have been members of the Northwestern Band who have gone fishing in Idaho um, and have been cited for fishing without a license by Idaho, which is what triggered this lawsuit um, from the tribe. So yeah, what does a treaty mean with respect to fishing rights? Uh, it would mean that the tribe doesn't have to get permission from the state to exercise them. The state can't veto their right to hunt and fish. The state can regulate in the interest of conservation and that's what this, our state does, Utah does, with the Northwestern Band. We have an agreement with the Northwestern Band that sets up um, limits and, and, con and times of year to go hunting, um, which is a good agreement where we can learn from each other best conservation practices, but the state can't just veto their hunting and fishing mm -hmm. rights and say you can't do it, you have to apply for a state license. <coughs> okay, so the bottom line is we sign this, we sign this treaty, the United States signs this treaty, um, there are certain assumptions made, it goes through historical sort of uh, growing pains, I guess, if you will. Yeah. And then now, fast forward to the modern day, Idaho is not honoring all aspects of that treaty and is fining Northwest Shoshones for hunting and fishing on the land that was agreed to be open to them. And uh, there's a lawsuit. Yeah. So w why are we involved in Idaho's lawsuit? Because the territory includes Utah? Yeah, so the... If I was a taxpayer, I would be thinking, well, this is Idaho's fight versus the federal government. 
they can just sort of have it. So are we so, doing it because we feel strongly uh, about the issue enough and on the side of the Shoshone that we want to be with them? Is that what right. it is? Well, a couple of responses to that question, I think, are one, our Utah state law itself recognizes that Utah has a government-to-government -government relationship with the eight tribes in Utah. And it is the same treaty that we're interpreting and Idaho's interpreting. The Shoshone, the northwestern band of Shoshone, their ancestral fishing and hunting grounds include Utah, include Idaho. It straddles the border. Uh, the second point is that members of the Northwestern Band are also citizens of the state of Utah and the state has an interest in ensuring that all of its citizens get all of the rights and benefits that they're entitled to under federal law. Okay. So we wanted to step in and say, hey, there's a treaty here that grants these rights. We recognize them. We think they should have them and they should be able to exercise them in Utah and Idaho and let's have a uh, uniform interpretation of the treaty across um, state boundaries. Okay. And so that's why Utah's involved. Okay. So the Northwest Band feels they should be able to hunt and fish on the, on the area encompassed by the, by the treaty. Yeah. We are in uh, the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals in Portland. You yeah. were arguing the case on behalf of the tribe and on behalf of the federal government and against Idaho. Yeah. What, what uh, is this sort of a normal course of the litigation process? It seems like we're really elevating this and the Supreme Court could be next. Yeah, well, let me, let me explain a little bit Idaho's position. Um, and you're right, oftentimes we align with Idaho on issues and on this one we diverge and we align with the United States government. Um, Idaho does not recognize their the Northwestern Band's <clears throat> hunting and fishing rights because they never relocated to a reservation. So when Idaho reads that treaty, Idaho says, well, the reservation of those hunting and fishing rights was a condition of going on the reservation. And if they don't go on the reservation, then they lose them. And we disagree with that interpretation. So the course of litigation has gone like this. We have a couple members of the tribe who've been cited by Idaho. The tribe itself brought this federal lawsuit in district court in Idaho uh, to get a declaration of their rights under the treaty. So that's a procedure you can do in federal court, declare what our rights are. The federal district court in Idaho um, granted Idaho's motion to dismiss, agreeing with Idaho's argument that there was this condition placed on hunting and fishing rights. The tribe appealed to the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals, Idaho's in the Ninth Circuit, and at that point, Utah and the federal government, Department of Justice on behalf of the Department of Interior, um, submitted amicus briefs in support of the tribe. So we're not a party to the case. <clears throat> Amicus, friend of the court, we want to give the court some more information about uh, how we view it and how the United States views it. And so uh, we did the briefing on the case and then the, we had oral argument this past week where on one side of the courtroom, the tribe, Utah, United States, on the other side is Idaho. And we all had the chance, to, uh, the three of us on our side, to get up and and, and say our piece on, on how we interpret the tribe and we're, uh, the treaty, how we interpret the treaty and how we're in agreement on its interpretation. Okay, so let me interject a little bit of human emotion in this. How upset are the Northwest Band of Shoshones over this action that Idaho has taken? I mean, they're, they're obviously pushing it legally, yeah. but do you think they're, they're actively angry about it? And then it's like a sticking point with, with them in the state of Idaho? Well, I mean, certainly they care about it. Yeah. Um, and, and it goes to, uh, I think that that concern derives from wanting to exercise rights under the treaty, but also kind of have that full recognition from Idaho as a recognized tribe in right. the United States with sovereignty. So it's both, it's both practical and uh, symbolic. Yeah, I okay. think there's... there's the practical point is there are, there are some members of the tribe who'd like to fish and hunt Idaho. It's not a lot, right? right. It's, it's a few. But it's the but, point but, of the thing. Yeah. Right. I wouldn't say that, I don't know that angry is the right word to describe it. They, they do care. And right. 
Um, we, like I said, we worked with the Northwestern Band on implementing an intergovernmental agreement on hunting and fishing, just so it's laid out. Uh, you know what times of year they're going to be out, and and that helps. You know, so that our non-Indian hunters are not out stepping on toes of our Indian hunters. And, sure. And and they. The, the, the tribe's very reasonable, so that's why I say I don't think it's, you know, a point of anger, but it's a point of let's make sure our rights are protected. So as an attorney, and personally, do you feel good about being on the side of the tribes? You feel like you're, um, you're making a point here on behalf of the tribe that is the right thing to do? I think we're on the right side of the law, right. and I think that's important. And... I, I really appreciate what Attorney General Reyes has done as he's been in office in that Utah hasn't always had the best relationship with the tribes either. Mm -hmm. You know, we've had litigation with another tribe in our state that's gone on literally like 40 years, right? <laughs> like a lifetime. And when Attorney General Reyes came in and saw this, he said, you know, we could do better in working with the tribes and understanding tribal sovereignty and tribal relationships. Um, one of the things he did in, he, that Attorney General Reyes did was bring in uh, Larry Echo Hawk, who's a former, you know, he was the number two official in the Department of Interior, and he was the top official for Indian Affairs during the Obama administration uh, to help at least our office understand the issues better. And since then, I think we've done a better job in working with tribes. Mm -hmm. um, and understanding that in the United States there are at least three sovereign entities. We, we often think of just two. We think mm -hmm. of the state governments and the federal government. And oftentimes we're in conflict over who gets authority over what area of law. And sometimes we forget that tribes have their own sovereign power. They have their own governments. And that relationship among the three sovereigns should be government to government and not um, trying to dictate what another sovereign is doing. And we certainly have to have negotiations, and sometimes that leads to court over, you know, who exercises jurisdiction over a particular area of law or a particular, particular area of land. But it's much better when we can sit down and talk with each other. So in this particular case, yes, I think we're on the right side of the law um, in recognizing their fishing rights under the treaty. Um, and it's... And we're working with them, and we have that open dialogue, which is a better relationship than we've sometimes had in the past. So what, in your opinion, is the, uh, is the key point that you made that you really felt good in court making that you thought that yeah. if you were one of the justices, you would have been like, oh, okay, this is the, you know, that point that they made really hits this out of the park and this is the this is going to be the basis of my yeah. decision. Is there one? Well, I think so there is. And that was how these fishing and hunting rights have have been framed. And we think they were incorrectly framed by the district court. And what I mean by that is the district court referred to them as rights that the United States granted to the tribes in the year 1868 as if they hadn't existed for centuries before them. So our main point in coming to court in our briefing and in our oral argument was to say, no, these rights are rights that have been exercised by the tribe for centuries. And so when they show up to a treaty, they're not trying to negotiate to get the right. They're making sure that the treaty recognize, recognize that they have this continued right to fish and hunt. And I think that framing of the issue is really important. It's something that the judges on the panel were interested in uh, because it does affect how you read the treaty and how you read you know, whether there's conditional language or not. And so I think we got that a point across. I don't know how the court will rule, um, but I do appreciate that the court understood that point and some of the other ones that we were making. I mentioned sure. earlier that when these treaties are negotiated, you have... Um, parties with unequal bargaining power. And what that means is that courts, when they interpret an Indian treaty, they actually use a set of interpretive rules that don't exist elsewhere in the law. And those rules are meant to take into account the fact that they had asymmetrical bargaining power, and they are that 
Um, you should interpret the treaty as the tribe would have understood it in the year 1868. And if there are any ambiguities in the treaty, you should interpret them in favor of the tribe. Um, and so we made those points as well to the court. And I think that the court understood that th those points and will take them into account when it issues its opinion. Okay. So we're at the beginning of February 2023. Yeah. When are we expecting uh, some kind of decision? The Ninth Circuit, um, I, I would anticipate it'll take a few months. Okay. And then do you expect this, that if it doesn't, uh, that one of the parties or the other is going to push it to the Supreme Court? Uh, we may do that. Um, I, I say we, I mean a party may do that. Um, and again, I can't predict how the Ninth Circuit will rule. Um, that's an avenue that would be open to to either party, and we'll just have to see when we get there. I don't think anybody's made any okay. decisions on it. Okay, cool. All right, so everybody take a deep breath. This was a deep dive into a lot of really heavy law, but it's something, an issue that that the Attorney General and that we at the office feel is really important to explore, and so that's why we brought it to you. So if you made it this far into the podcast, thank you very much. We'll have more and updates on the decision from the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals later. And for now, on behalf of Lance Sorensen, I'm Richard Pyatt. See you next time.